Uh, Daniel from Pith Network, the show is yours. Um, and folks, if you have questions or thoughts as you go, you can do that in the comments, or we could also do some hand raising as we go. Daniel, the floor is yours, sir. Awesome. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, everyone, for taking the time to um, join this call right here. So my name is Daniel, and I'm a contributor to the PIF Network. Um, PIF Network is a decentralized oracle that publishes financial market data to multiple blockchains. And we started out on Solana, but now we are live on Ethereum and many other EVM chains, as well as Aptos and um, other chains. So our market data is contributed by over 70 first party publishers of which you will see some of them in um, later slides, including some of the biggest exchanges and market making firms in the world. So traditionally we have clearing houses, we have trading companies, banks, brokerage firms, and so on. And retail users would have to subscribe to them directly to get first party data. PIF network basically aggregates first party data onto the blockchain and provides this data to anyone who wants to use them. For example, if you want to build like a trading bot or um, say a boring lending platform, a derivatives, synthetics, or infrastructure platform, and you need a way to price these assets, that's where you can use PIF network. So let me just briefly go through our timeline. Um, August 2021, we went live on mainnet. And January 2022, the white paper was released. If you're interested, you can go to the website and uh, read more about it. And by April 2022, we have about 90% of Solana TVS. And if you were in the crypto space in 2022, you know that NFTs were super hot. And so we basically were competing for precious block space with these projects. And some of them would spam the network for the newest NFT drop. And hence that caused us to fail to land price updates as often as we want to. And so we started thinking about other ways to solve this problem. And so if you look at um, August, 2022, right here, it says PIFnet PIF V2 launches. So PIFnet is basically a fork of um, Solana, but it, it is a separate network that is specially configured to be a proof of authority chain. So then it is, purely just for PIF network to push price updates um, onto the chain. And October 2022, we partnered with SIBO, which is the largest US options exchange. Um, in fact, the total options volume was 3.4 billion contracts just in 2022 alone. So let's go to the next slide. We have, right now we have 80 over data providers. We have about 800k PIF client downloads. We are connected to 10 blockchains. We have um, 105 integration partners and more than 200 price feeds, of which includes crypto, FX, equities, and metals. So PIF has onboarded a new data publisher almost every week. And these publisher are um, some of your biggest, you know, like trading institution or market making firms. Um, so we want to have more data providers on board and with more data providers, we get better data. And with better data, we get more customers and, you know, with more customers, we get more fees. And so the flywheel um, continues, which helps to improve the, the network itself. So sim these are some of the data providers that uh, I briefly mentioned earlier on. As you can see, we have um, HRT, Jane Street, Susquehanna Tower as part of the trading firms. And for TradFi, we have SIBO, LMAX, MAMAX, IEX. And for crypto exchanges, we have Binance, Bybit, OKX, and KuCoin, among many others. Right now we have about 80 data providers and we continue to onboard them every month. As for price feeds, we have about 218 price, price feeds right now. And these are some of our consumers that are using us. For example, you can see um, Solan, Synthetix, Ribbon, some of the biggest DeFi applications in the space. 
right. So right now we have about 10 blockchains. Um, we started out on Solana and we're connected on Aptos, BNB chain, Aurora, Optimism, Ethereum, KuCoin, Arbitrum, Base, and Kronos, and many more to come. Um, yeah, so these are just some of the quotes by um, some of the top protocols in the respective chains. For example, Brad Harrison of Venus, which is one of the largest boring lending platform on BNB, um, basically saying that, you know, they're, uh, with by using PIP, they're able to access the time sensitive and real world data. Um, and we are also live on Ethereum and Optimism, um, on Base, Kronos, Aptos, Arbitrum, and Polygon. So the future of PIF, we basically want to expand to as many blockchains as possible. We want to make our data available anywhere and everywhere so that anyone who wants to use our data to build something, they should be able to do so. And that also includes onboarding many uh, price feeds, including crypto, more equities, more FX, more metals, and maybe even other um, assets in the future. Right, so that's a very simple uh, brief on what PIF Network is. Right now, I'd like to show you our website, um, followed by two demonstrations. The first one is to show you how you can use our JavaScript client to stream real-time price data onto your off-chain application. And the second one is to show you how you can deploy a smart contract on Solana using PIF price feed. Um, and you know you can play with the data however you want to. So let's go to the website right now. If you go to pith.network, this is um, what you'll see. And if, if you scroll down, you can see some of the stats here. And there are sample quotes right here where you can reference and um, use it in your smart contract. For example, if you're interested in the Solana one, you can just click on the Solana tab and copy the code right here. These are showing some of our first party data providers, um, our consumers, and some of the featured articles uh, that we have been featured on. But I wanna show you um, our price feeds right here. So if you click on this, it will show you the Bitcoin USD price feed. And you can see that the price is ticking according to um, PIFnet slot, which is a fork of Solana. So it's about 400 MS every update, right? And this is all in real time. And not only we have the price value right here, but we also have the confidence interval right here because for one single digital asset, there's no single price, right? Because it might be trading at 10 different exchanges, 10 different places, and they're all trading at different prices. So the confidence interval kind of serves as a way to show the range of the prices. And you can use this data um, in your smart contract. You know, for example, like if uh, the confidence interval is too wide, then you might not want to use this price or, you know, you can do whatever you want with it. So this is the live data right here, but we also have historical data like um, the past one hour or past one day, one week, one month, and uh, yeah, maximum one month. And if you scroll down here, you can see um, the price components. So these are all the data providers that I've mentioned earlier on. Right now they are pseudo anonymous. Um, so you're not able to see like which pop key is which publisher, but you're able to see the price that they publish as well as the confidence um, interval. And we aggregate all of these prices and push out a single price right here. So that's for Bitcoin, but if you go to our price feeds page, you're able to filter by um, either just crypto or say you wanna look at equity data you're able to do so. Right now, the price is 
um, stalled because the market opens in like maybe 15 minutes, I think. Um, but once the market opens, you should see this price ticking along um, in real time, uh, real time price update. And that's pretty amazing because there's no way you can get real time, um, actual real time equity data right now. If you go to Yahoo Finance, you're getting like delayed 20 minutes data. And if you want to get actual real time data, you would have to subscribe to a Bloomberg terminal and it might cost you like 20 grand a year. Right. And that's not exactly affordable to everyone. For example, if you're just starting out and you, you, you know, you're, it's just um, a hobby, you want to build something um, that's too much to, to be able to afford to. But um, right now you can use PIF. It's all free. It's real time. You're able to get some of the biggest equity, uh, top 30 US equity data right here. Um, so yeah, besides equity, we also have FX data. Um, and for metal, we have gold and silver. Um, so that's all for the website. Right now, I want to show you how you can um, stream these real-time prices onto your off-chain app, just like how this website is showing um, all these prices right here. So first of all, let's go to, I'm um, sorry. Okay, so PIF client JS, this is our repository on GitHub. It's open source. If you search for PIF client JS, you should be able to get to this repository right here. And I wanna bring your attention to this file, example underscore websocket underscore usage dot TS. Um, so as you can see, it's a very straightforward and simple um, file. It has like the actual logic right here is like 10 lines. Uh, yeah, maybe 15. <clears throat> but basically what we're trying to do here is we, we create a Solana connection and we also initialize the PIF program key. And then we pass in the connection as well as the public key into PIF connection. And we call the on price chains verbose um, callback and we pass in this function right here. Basically, for every price change, you get the product account and you get a price account, right? And what we're doing right here is we check if the symbol is sold. Hey, Daniel. Yes, hey, Daniel. Yep. Could you can you pump that up a couple pumps? It's a little small. Oh, yeah, sure. Sorry. Awesome. Thank you. Is that fine? Oh uh, yeah, fun. that looks good. That looks good. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. So if the product is Solana USD, then we want to print um, the price as well as the confidence interval right here. Otherwise, we just say that price is not available. So let's go ahead and um, run this here. Yeah, so you can see that this is streaming real time every 400 ms and you get both the price and the confidence interval so with this you can do um, a lot of powerful things for example like if you want to build an arbitrage bot um, <clears throat> you want to compare like PIF prices against for example like binance prices or um, coinbase or whatever right um, you could do that or um, if you are building a DEX and you need a way to show the prices on your um, front end, you can you could also use this, um, use our SDK right here. All right, so that's that's just a very simple and straightforward demo for um, the JavaScript client. Next, I'd like to show you how you could use our um, smart contract client to you know read PIF price data in, into your smart contract and do um, whatever you want with it right so for this example 
we have the PIF SDK RS, which once again, you could also find it on Git GitHub. It's open source. Um, so if you go to the examples folder right here and go to sole contract, there is a readme file here, which shows you exactly how you can run the example um, contract right here. But before that, I'd like to just briefly go through with you how the contract works. So for that, let's bring up the source folder right here and go to um, processor.rs. Okay, so for this example contract, we have two example instructions. The first one is to init um, the price feed. And you the first thing you do right here is just check if um, if the key trying to configure the price feed ID is authorized. And right here, we're, ch we're just checking if it's the PIF program ID, right? Or if it's already initialized, then we throw an error. Otherwise, we will load the price feed um, from the account info, and then um, that's it, basically. And the second instruction right here, which is really the core instruction of this contract is this right here is called loan to value. And basically it takes in the loan quantity and the collateral quantity. And then um, it checks right here. So it, it first loads the price feed and then it checks if um, the, uh, the maximum loan value of the, the, the price feed. And right here, this is the, for the second price feed, the collateral value right here. And this chunk basically just um, normalize the value because for different price feed, they might be using different exponent. And lastly, we check whether the value of the collateral is higher. If the value of collateral is higher, then it's, it's fine. If the value of the loan is higher, then we throw an error. So it's a very simple and straightforward contract. Um, obviously, when you use this in your own smart contract, you might want to do something a little bit more sophisticated. But this basically shows you a very easy way of how you can use PIF data in your smart contract. All right, so um, let's go ahead and try to deploy this. Pre I've already previously deployed um, the contract, so I'm going to go ahead and delete this and just do this live. All right, so we are in the example sole contract folder. Um, just run this script. Okay, so finish building um, the contract. We're gonna go ahead and set the RPC to DEFNET. And then we're gonna go ahead and deploy the contract. Sometimes this might fail because of the RPC issue. So if you encounter, um, if you weren't able to complete this step, just try it multiple times and you should be able to do so. So once we've deployed the contract, um, the last step here is to invoke the contract, right? So let's go ahead and look at what invoke.sh does. Um, basically, we will just um, CD into this folder right here, install TypeScript, run build, and we will invoke, we'll do node invoke.js, which is basically the JavaScript version of this file right here. So let's quickly go through this invoke.ts file and see what it does. Um, so as you can see, there is an invoke function right here, which take in loan and collateral, right? If you scroll all the way down, uh, we see that there are two variables right here. So the first one is if to USD and we have a pop key right here. And the way you can get this pop key is basically go to the website, go to developers tab, scroll down, go to price feed IDs, change the filter to Solana DevNet. 
and say you want to search for Ethereum price feed. Um, and you can click on this price feed ID and just copy it and paste it here. And as you can see, it's the same price feed ID. So same for USDT. Let's just check if you know this is USDT. But you can see this is indeed USDT. And we pass in the price feed ID to the function. Um, right, so let's look at what the function does. All this part basically just reads the contract key pair. And if you scroll down, we prepare the pair account to get the airdrop. Um, and then we try to create an instruction right here. Over here, we create the we prepare the accounts and create the instruction data for the transactions. And right here, we invoke init instruction, which is instruction zero. And from line seventy eight to line one hundred and one, this is like the main logic um, of the code, right? So basically, it's invoking loan to value instruction, and um, you can see that this is actually hexadecimal um, string. Um, so this equals to one, right? And this is 3,000. So we have, if you remember earlier on, loan was ETH. So this is saying one ETH and collateral is 3,000 USDT. Um, so that's basically it. Um, if you scroll down, the last part here is just trying to invoke in it using an unauthorized key, which um, therefore it should fail right here. Um, okay, so that's really it. Let's go ahead and try to run the script. So this might take a while because it's creating multiple um, instructions on the back end. So we've successfully invoked the init instruction and we have a transaction hash right here. And right now we're doing checking loan to value ratio. Um, and again, it succeeded. So we have this transaction hash right here. So let's copy this and take a look at what this instruction does. All right, so scroll down here, it says success. And we look at the logs right here, you can see that it says loan quantity is one, collateral quantity is 3000, and the maximum value is um, this number right here times 10 to the power of the exponent, which is minus 8. And so this is the value of uh, Ethereum right now. Go to DefNet and take a look at ETH. Um, so, yeah, this is the value that we are seeing right here. Um, the minimum collateral value is this number right here. So this is USDT. And the value of collateral is higher. So you're allowed to loan um, one ETH, right? So let, now let's go ahead and try to change and play around with the numbers. Um, so it's here right here. So let's say we want to... Um, let, let me bring this window right here. If we want to do maybe um, three if, right? So then we'll do this, convert, and we get um, zero three. So we just change this. And run the script again. So 
So this time it should fail because we only provided 3000 USDT as collateral while we are trying to borrow three ETH. And the value of the loan quantity is way more than the collateral. So it shouldn't succeed. Let's see. This sometimes takes a while because it depends on the RPC and we're using the public definite RPC, which, you know, it's not the fastest. Okay. So as we expected, it threw an error right here. It says loan quantity is three, collateral quantity is 3000 and the loan value is this number, which is way more than um, this number right here. So um, there's an error, right? Um, so yeah, or you know, if you want to change, for example, from ETH to BTC, you could also do that. So just copy this, um, replace this, and run the script again. And once again, it should fail because three BTC is way more than three thousand USDT. Okay, right. So as expected, it's um, it failed again because you know the the loan value is more than the collateral value. All right, so that's a very simple expl explanation and demonstration of how you can use PIF data in your smart contract. Um, any questions, everyone? No so I, I, I do have a question, um, you know, because this is something that is relevant to a couple of our cadets and, and we've actually talked with Ed a little bit about it. What about, um, you know, carbon credit regenerative finance type feeds? Um, is that something that's coming? How can we do that? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, that is indeed on our roadmap. We plan to support basically every kind of asset that is able to be um, tokenized or um, digitalized. So in the future, we, I mean, definitely there, there are plans to support that. We don't have an exact um, time range for you right now, but uh, it's something that we're looking at. Awesome. So I'm going to actually ask Nate a quick question here because I know that that he knows these details better than I do. Um, if there is a, a service from which you already pull data that does offer those is there a way um to pull that in or does that absolutely require your end doing that in other words can we utilize that for lack of a better word pipeline to grab that information or or that's going to require you guys opening the gate of the gatekeeping So, in my, in my opinion, you need to have um, a data provider to do that, and that takes time to validate, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, because I know that um, I know that some of the providers for your feeds do have carbon credits, but I'm, my question is, if it doesn't require a whole new integration just opening it up to that data is that an easier path or does that require a lot of your more of your process on your end daniel um no it's uh so we we do have a standardized process for every publisher um to publish data onto the pif network it's it's a software it's called pif agent um so all you have to do is just plug 
plug that software into your system and publish data based on the specs that we've laid out, and you should be able to get data onto a PIF network. So essentially, we could be okay. a data provider pretty easily is what we're looking at. Um, so if we wanted to provide carbon credit data, we could go ahead and do that. Like because in PIF, which, which I found that I found that that's it's actually it has to be compatible with New York Stock Exchange, not something like delayed more than a minute. Is that a question or is that a statement? I'm sorry, I'm trying to. It's so both. I think, yeah, and I'm kind of putting pieces together from a chat. Um, about it's that, that, yeah. It's like in PIF, which is like on par with the New York Stock Exchange, and you can't really use an agent for delayed data feeds, which is like it has. To, it shouldn't be delayed more than sixty seconds. Gotcha. To be exact, so that's why I was asking the question. Okay. Um, any other questions? Yeah, go ahead, Juan. Yes, I'm interested in uh, understand how a uh, pipe um, works. Uh, do you have like um, a smart contracts deployed in each chain? Do you have uh, validators working in each chain? How do you um, of time data, the data? Good question. Um, so on Solana, we actually, we we started on Solana, as I mentioned earlier on, and we deployed our smart contract on Solana. So you're able to directly interact with the contract on Solana to get the, um, the price feed data that you want. But for cross-chain, it works a little bit differently because um, deploying the contracts onto each specific chain directly, it's First of all, it's not very efficient because we would have to continue to push data just like on Solana. And if no one uses the data, it's um, every time we push a data, it costs gas, right? For example, on Ethereum, it's going to be super expensive. It's not efficient. And if no one uses the data, it's just, it's just very wasteful. Um, so the way that we've designed the cross-chain um, model is a pool model. And basically, the way it works is that we have an off-chain oracle, um, which you can get all this data, um, all these real-time price feeds. And then you, when you need to do something, for example, like a borrowing lending platform, when you want to liquidate your user, the way you would do it is you would get um, these price updates, and then you would send a price update on-chain to that chain that you're on. So if you're on Ethereum, then you would send a price update. And so the responsibility of updating the price goes onto the consumers and not onto PIF. Um, so that makes it way more scalable. And the way we bridge the data right there is by using wormhole. Um, if you don't know wormhole, they're a generic messaging protocol um, where you know you you can not only bridge like a token, but essentially just a, a generic message. Yeah, and I want to just highlight the importance of that model, right? If you go back to like Chainlink, um, your protocol is spending massive amounts of money every block <laughs> when you're pulling that data constantly. And so when you're thinking about an option for your protocol, even, even though data is cheap, gas is cheap on Solana, it's still think about that every 400 milliseconds if you're on a savings and lending protocol and you're not actually liquidating, you're still pulling those price feeds and paying those gas fees. So this is a really radically different model and it's a really important point to think about. Exactly, and um, that is actually why we also, we forked Solana and created PIFnet because on PIFnet we control um, the gas. So essentially gas is very cheap and we are able to continuously push prices onto PIFnet and for every other change, they'll be reading data from PIFnet. Nice. So, um, you know, we, we looked at the code here um, and you did a great demonstration of that. Um, if I'll use a random example here, um, if I needed to pull 
uh, some price feeds on a time schedule. Um, does that kind of, you know, keeper clockwork functionality yet work in Pith, or do we need to compose um, some other tooling to trigger the, the call of that price feed? Um, it's a good question, good point. Um, you're not, so we don't provide some kind of keeper or crank function, um, but from my understanding, there are a couple of other protocols on Solana that's able to help you do that. For example, like Clockwork or um, you know other automation protocol. Not very familiar with those protocols, so uh, I don't have you know like a good answer for you on this. Yeah, and I, I only ask that um, not because I want to make a comparison uh, to Chainlink, but you know the the Chainlink model does have the price feed and the keeper, which I think they call automation now. Um, and, uh, so, you know, being able to, uh, port a project from there that utilizes that tandem of tools, um, is, you know, I'm glad to hear you say that because the, you know, the plan is to use Pith and something like Clockworks, uh, for a specific project that I'm thinking of and already looking at the composability of that. So I think that, you know, that is another one that anybody in the room that's thinking about not necessarily needing a constant stream of this data, but being able to call it on some sort of time schedule. Um, there is the capacity to do that by composing a couple of different Solana tools um, and services. Any other questions? All right. So, um, Daniel, anything else you have to share with us? No, that's all. Um, thank you very much, everyone, for your time. I hope you learned something. I hope you had fun. Um, thank you for having me. Absolutely. This was great. Um, Daniel, I, I, I love the demonstration, did a great job with the code and showing everybody how to use it and integrate it, which I know is very much appreciated by, you know, the devs in the room. Um, if we need to get some support, what's the best way to get in touch with you folks at Pith? Yeah, so we do have our socials on Telegram. It's at Pith Network um, or Discord. Or if you could just go to our website, and actually it's all here. Um, just go to the main page and scroll all the way down. Our socials are here. We are mostly active on Discord and Telegram. So just pop in and ask your questions and our friendly community managers or developers will try their best to help you with your problems. Perfect. Uh, I'm sure you'll be seeing a number of us over there. <laughs> I um, definitely will be in there. So Daniel, thanks so much. Really appreciate your time. Appreciate everybody coming out for this. We will get this video prepared. Uh, I know personally I'm going to need to slow it down and stop it a couple times to really check out the code a little deeper because I'm slow. Uh, but really enjoyed this. Appreciate you guys and Ed and the whole team for making this happen. Um, for those of you, you know, looking forward to what's next with Solana um, Enrichment Week, we have Helios in a couple of hours. So we will see you all there. Everybody else, thanks for being here. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you on the flip side. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel.